So how did you find it so far? Tiring? Too many things? Maybe yes, too many things, definitely. Uh, we are going to do a big change from uh, the, the previous three lectures. We are going to forget, at least for the moment, ideal of points, and we are going to work with the algebraic varieties on uh, the cone of semi-definitive positive matrices. Okay? This is uh, the mathematical, the algebraic part corresponding that we are interested in when working with Gaussian distributions. So what I'm going to do first is to do a big review on Gaussian distributions and Gaussian models. I know Professor Mahendranyol has already told you a lot about this, but this is possibly the most important thing I'm going to mention in the time here. So please, if you have to remember just one thing out of my lectures, let it be it. You will find it in many textbooks. But I realized talking with students through the years that's never enough to repeat it over and over again. And then when we talk about maximum likelihood equations, this is a big branch actually within algebraic statistics. But I'll dedicate to it only one slide and I will explain you why. But let me repeat, it's an important topic because for example, there has been a workshop in August dedicated to it in France, I think, if I remember. Then I will go into the topic, yeah, the main topic of this lecture, which is the algebraic representation of Gaussian distributions and as a consequence of Gaussian models. And as an application, I'm going to consider Markov combinations and meta structural meta-analysis. I will tell you a bit more about that. But this will be the main part of the motivation for my work. Okay, so now let's start with repeating what Professor Mahendran has already told you. Multivariate Gaussian or normal distribution are very, very popular. Very commonly occurring continuous probability loads. Why they are so important? Well, most likely because of the central limit theorem and a bunch of other limit theorems coming with it that uh, under very, usually very mild conditions that can be verified on practical data, the mean of uh, independent random variables drawn from uh, the same, uh, well, independent copies of the same distribution are approximately distributed as a normal. And this is irrespective of the form of the even original distribution. Then another important thing is that the moment of the multivariate Gaussians are known. Here let me tell you about two developments of algebraic statistics from this. Okay. First development, very, very recent, PhD student starting this year is about, okay, you have, you know the moments of a normal distribution, you know the generating function, the characteristic function. Can we use algebraic means to exploit this in order to do estimation via the methods of moments. That is, uh, the estimation via methods of moments means you have the empirical moments, these are based on your data, and you have the theoretical moments, the expected values of x to the alpha, where x is a random variable. Okay. The Method of moment means I want to equate theoretical and empirical models and want to solve for my unknowns, which are the model parameters. Sometimes these equations, system of equations, is actually a polynomial form. So sometimes it can be solved via polynomial methods. 
Now, these students want to buy, find a big family of distributions by which this can be done very efficiently using the polynomial algebra of ideals and the algebraic geometry stuff. So this is the first, <coughs> something I'm not going to tell you in what it is because the results are not here yet. This is the project here. Other thing that was born out of this is called finitely generated cumulants. That is, there are relationships, polynomial relationships, for some special classes of distributions, including the normal Gaussian, that connects moments, okay? So there is a polynomial, actually, describing the moments of spatial distribution. If you think about multivariate Gaussian, you know that mu square, the, expect the variance, think one dimension. The variance is equal to the bias squared times Sorry, start again. Start again. The mean square error is equal to the bias square plus the variance. Okay? That's a polynomial relations at the end if you apply it to normal among uh, the mean values and the, uh, the first order moment and the second order moment. You can play with that. Okay. There are a large, there is a large class of distribution that, like the multivariate Gaussians, enjoy this type of uh, polynomial relationship among the moments. This in particular means that, uh, okay, you have one polynomial, I assume, that is a function of the theoretical moments of your distribution. Another, poly another moment of a higher order comes in and you are interested in studying it. Well, you can use normal form type of computations. You can reduce the higher order model over this polynomial to find this representation on the vector space basis of the quotient space obtained by the set of polynomials modulo, the idea generated by that equation. Uh, you'll find a paper about that who started exactly finally generated cumulants and explains uh, carefully of what I just said in a few minutes. And this is a research topic actually that needs still more investigation because that's been done in one di for one-dimensional variables. We know that it can be done, it works for multivariate Gaussian. How can we stand it to non, well, to more general classes of distributions? Okay. Here just I stated one other reason why normal distribution comes out very useful in uh, practical applications. Uh, excuse me, Professor, have you spoken about that? Yeah, yeah okay. About the Gaussian, yes, but not about the non-Gaussian. Okay. Okay, so we'll skip a little bit. And now let me review some probability. This I'm sure you spoke about. So you have Z, which is a random vector with K components. We say that Z enjoys a normal standard density function, follows a normal distribution, and we will write Z normal, K dimension, zero mean, variance covariance is the identity matrix K by K, if we can write the density function of Z in this form which is the product of the density function of each of its components. The meaning of this density function is exactly this. The probability that my random vector belongs to some subset B is equal to the integral of the density. Now, how out of this random vector and out of this normal uh, distribution, standard normal distribution, by affine transformations, we can move, uh, we can generate any Gaussian law. So let's move mu, mu, sorry, mu, be a n-dimensional vector of here, in this page, we are doing probability. So in this page, mu is known, is given. And then we have a, a matrix with real entries of dimension n times k. 
And we assume for simplicity that A, A transpose is invertible. Then the random vector x can be written as mu plus when we define the random vector x in dimension n, defined as a, a mu plus a sub. We know, we say that it follows a normal n-dimensional uh, uh, distribution with mean mu and variance sigma, where sigma is a transpose, and it can be shown by a theorem that I'm convinced you mentioned, that you can transform this density in such a way. This will be the density, probability density function of x. Now, remember this, because this is what we are going to work on later on. Sigma, a transpose is the covariance, k equals sigma to the minus one is called concentration matrix. Having a zero, I'm saying here, having a zero in sigma means that, okay, means that the component, the two components whose indices correspond to that uh, zero in the matrix are independent among themselves. And, okay, and this is quite important modeling tool. Having a zero in the concentration matrix implies conditional independence of these two components given all the others. And it's this thing that will allow us to transform a Gaussian density into a polynomial. Okay, about marginal and conditional distributions, I'm not going to say much. We, are not, we need to know that, but you explain, so I'm going to carry on. You've already seen this slide. I want you to put here just to say, look, this is probability, and now I want to enter into the realm of statistics. <coughs> This means, essentially, in the case of Gaussians, it means that my parameter space will be the unknown mu and the unknown sigma matrix that we would like to estimate via a data set. In order to identify one a subset of the possible values assumed by mu and sigma, compatible with my data. Compatible how? There are many ways. Okay, so let me say one important thing here. These are all links, these uh, two points are actually links into topics within algebraic statistics. Uh, now I consider that sigma and mu might be not known. Maybe some of their components, some of their elements are not known and some are given. I want still to uh, have that the inverse of the covariance matrix exists, such that I'm away from the generate cases, from the generate distributions. So I observe what well, it's have been <laughs> well known and well exploited in many contexts that the Gaussian family is actually an exponential family of statistical models. This means that this argument can be manipulated in such a way to make an evidence that there is a manipulation of the parameters. Instead of mu and sigma one, I will consider mu transpose sigma one, my theta one new parameter, sigma to the minus one, theta two, new bunch of parameters, such that there is a linear relation between some important uh, summaries of the data, that is some important statistics, and this is linear. So observe here, you have this times x. You have this times sigma trace. If you think about what trace is, you have spotted that there is a relationship a linear relationship between the, the elements of x, x transpose and the elements of sigma to the minus one. That is, that is having sigma called the sample covariance, okay, and having x.
which will be the mean, the sample mean, you have, we have rewritten this uh, argument of the exponent as uh, a linear relationship in uh, mu transpose k, k and the sufficient statistics, x and sigma. Here I've done this computation for one sample. Vector, vectorial sample, but just one. Then I consider m i i d copies of this same x. Well, in this case, the parameters mu transpose k and k remains the same, while the sufficient statistics x and s becomes the mean of x and the mean of s. Okay. Uh, to show that, uh, have you already seen this? Okay. To show that, it's sufficient to say, well, what if I have an M sample? What will be the joint distribution of an M independent sample? Will be the product of these things, multi where evaluated at x1, x2, x3, up to xm. You just perform this product, and you end up actually showing that uh, you can rewrite it as mu sigma to the minus one times the mean of the axis, and then the trace where here, sorry, the trace of sigma to the minus one, but here you have the sum xi, xi transpose divided m. Okay. Why did I stress this? Well, because this is entry point into Markov basis for Gaussian models. Actually, Markov basis for exponential families. Not only so, no, and not only this is for you and uh, the idea. This is uh, the entry point in this writing. Not only when I'm thinking entry point, sorry, of algebraic statistics uh, here, not only when I'm thinking of models coming out from contingency tables, but when I think of a general exponential family, where I can imagine that that is a distribution which can be written like the exponent of something psi, which I didn't mention, but the cumulative uh, um, generating function, psi depending only on the parameters, and then a linear combination of some sufficient statistics and some transformation, some other parameters, which will be transformation of my natural parameters. Okay. That was, uh, let's say, a connection. Now, another connection between uh, this theory of Gaussian families and uh, uh, algebraic uh, polynomial methods is given by the maximum likelihood estimation method. Mm -hmm. Now we have an M sample. In this slide, just not to have too much notation, it's already enough, X is the vector of vectors. So we have M independent copies here, of a vector of dimension n. Now, I imagine to have data which has drawn from here, and that I have my model, my joint model for x, my joint statistical model. Now, there is a switch of paradigm, standard one, that tells me, okay, look at this joint density, not as a function of the uh, data point x, but as a function of a parameter. Then you change the name. You call it capital L, and you name it likelihood function. Very silly paradigm, but why this distinction helps? Sometimes to just, you quickly look at the page and you see what's like, of interest for you. Then the little x I repeat is my, are my observed data. And then I'm looking for the value of the parameter which maximize the error. 
This is called maximum likelihood estimator. It might be that it's not unique. It might be that there are, it's, there are infinite values at which the maximum is reached. Okay? Usually, I prefer to give this definition with arg sup rather than arg max, so that I know it exists. Um, okay. If my parameter space theta, like in the example of the Gaussian, is uh, r times, well, if you think uh, one dimensional normal will be r times r greater than zero, either otherwise it will be r for the mean times what can a various covariance matrix be? Well, it should be just a, a semi -defin a definite positive matrices, semi definite if I allow for the generate case. But then sometimes I know that some things cannot occur, and we'll see big classes of models, the graphical models, why this happens. So that will have some constraint. So a typical way to address this problem will be to consider it as a constraint optimization problem. There are means based on algebraic method, polynomial algebra, to address this type of issues. And there is actually a, a full book on that, authored by uh, Bernstein first, with uh, some other, one other course, or I don't know. Another classical way to address this problem is let's consider the likelihood equations, if they exist. That is, we set the gradient of the log likelihood equal to zero. We want to find the critical points, I'm saying, of the likelihood functions. I'm saying anything more than that. When the gradient of the log likelihood are polynomials, then we could just try to find, to say, okay, not only optimization of polynomials kicks in, but actually, if this is a polynomial, my object is to find the zeros of this polynomial set. So I could use all of that theory, finding the zeros of this type of polynomials. Well, well, for spatial sets of model, models F. And this is, when I told you there is this uh, workshop, there has been, there was this workshop, uh, this is the problem they had to address. So they restricted their interest to some, uh, um, to some statistical models, including, of course, Gaussian, and decided to uh, solve this type of uh, equations, system of equations. Actually, solve it is a bit too ambitious. And I'm saying here where it's too ambitious. Let's define first the number of complex solutions of the log likelihood equations. This is called the maximum likelihood degree of the model. Often, it's much larger than the number of real solutions. Nevertheless, it's much, much easier to solve. That's why, in this area, many people are trying to determine this number. Now, if the uh, log likelihood function, or the likelihood functions, behave well, as they often do in exponential, as they do in exponential family, maybe not in a curved exponential families, but usually they do, you don't need to resort to these polynomial methods. Okay? You can do the computation often by hand. But when we are not within an exponential family, then this equation can be really complicated. Still polynomials, but really complicated. And an example of non-exponential uh, family is given by mixtures of distributions in general. And this is what people are really trying to work on. This assumes that there are some hidden variables and some observables connected, okay? I can observe, I cannot observe, I might have some prior information on what the proportions of my mixtures are. But again, most likely there will be more, there will be, this uh, information will be modeled via some statistical model. 
So there will be here going on a combination of two statistical models, one for the prior distribution and one for the actual observables. And data are available only on this second set. And this is what's making, uh, well, making the approach of algebraic solving this, this equation, then try to solve this equation, or at least compute a complex number of solutions, interesting. And that's why people are working on that. Okay. If you Google maximum likelihood degree, you'll find a lot of examples, a lot of papers. I don't give further details about this here because each paper deals with one particular model. I think it's too restrictive. It's very interesting because the algebra, the mathematics they had to do to solve this is really good, smart mathematics. But I think that until it's been, they, I say they because I don't work in this specific area, they will manage to find a general method to give quickly and efficient the maximum likelihood degree in the real case, not only the complex solution, but the real solution. Until there will be this algorithm coming out, this method is not really of great interest in statistics. Okay? Sorry for showing you something that might not be interesting, but I repeat, it's a big part of the world of algebraic statistics at the moment. Okay. Um, okay. I guess I can skip this bit. What I just want to so say about this is that the maximum likelihood estimator for our normally distributed in the independent and dimensional sample are actually what I was talking about before, the sample mean and the sample covariance. Interesting, as the random variables, these two are independent. Here, I'm just making notes about what if the parameter space is the full space, then we know that MLE of mu is, well, here should be capital sigma, sorry, exists unique if the sample method is invertible. And is given exactly what I said. If instead I have some constraints on my parameter space, then I will most likely find the maximum uh, of the likelihood function on the boundary of this space. What is that I would like to talk about is this little tiny bit. This is a very important class of uh, uh, statistical models, which are graphical models. Uh, Professor Mayandron, tell me, are we entering unknown uh, field here? I think graphical models are unknown. Up to then, it's fine. Okay. So here I should go in some details. That's right. Okay. Then here I need to go back to this. Bear this in mind. Okay? This says covariance zero independence. Concentration zero conditional independence. Graphical models encode this. A very excellent reference is this book. If you're a mathematician, you love it. If you're a statistician, you know you should love it, but it's a bit hard. So, graphical models, I need a graph. What are the vertices of the graph? The vertices of my graph are the components and the variables, the elementary variables of my problem. What are the edges? Well, there is an edge among two variables if the concentration metric corresponding to those two variables is zero. Notice that here we have a directed graph, graphs with no loops. Now, little question. If you have three variables, x, y, z, Okay. How many 
graphical models can you construct on these three variables? strange? Okay, certainly not. So I increase the number of uh, nodes, you know what's going on. What the statistical model these one, two, three, four classes, let's say, correspond? What did I say? Okay, here all variables are connected. Here I'm saying that I will not impose any constraint on the concentration matrix. So here, my problem, my parameters, my second order parameters will be three variances. Symmetric matrix, I don't write anymore. My concentration matrix, again, the inverse of this, which I have to assume exists, will be a full matrix. Maybe I will observe, I will have to estimate some of these sigmas with zero, but a priori, I cannot do that. Now, this, by the way, it's called the, that's called the saturated model. This model. Write the inverse of the of the covariance. Let's write the concentration. Okay. So I will have the three elements of the diagonal. What will be the off-diagonal elements? Zeros. Zeros. Fully independent order. My parameter space is now only three positive functions, found positive values. This one, let's call Where is my zero's values, if there is any zero here? Yeah. 
I will add zero here and something there. Okay. It's these matrices that we want to turn into polynomial. Can you can you see ahead and see how this can happen? Okay. Now let me give you some notation. Here we have this multivariate Gaussian. We will ignore mu in graphical models. Mu is ignored. We set mu equal to zero. Why? We can do that because estimation of mu and sigma can be done independently, at least in uh, like maximum likelihood type of estimation. Furthermore, graphical models are defined only through sigma. If you consider a subvector of your random vector, that I know why I called it uh, y, sorry, instead of x, doesn't matter. Y is my vector now. Uh, I take one component, indicated with yv, take a subset, subvector, indicated this way. And the results shown before, and a couple of days ago, show that these are the variance covariance matrices, where this will be, of course, one single element. This is the submatrix out of this big sigma involving only indices in the set A. Easy. Okay. Now, let's consider three disjoint subsets of uh, our vertices, our index set. Could be a partition or maybe not. Doesn't matter. What's really important is they are disjoint. Now, Y satisfies the condition Y A independent, the subvector over A is independent on the subvectors of a B conditional in C, and this is the shorthand notation for that. If and only if all the submatrices of this form of sigma, sorry, if and only if this, the, there is one <laughs> submatrix of this form has rank equal to C, to the norm of C. So let's repeat this because it's the key point. I add my matrix sigma, and I consider out of it a submatrix whose row are the row indexed by A and C, and the columns, the columns indexed by B and C. This might be a rectangular matrix. Depends on how many indices are in A, B, and C. Okay? I'm going to consider all sub-matrices of this one and check they are right. I want to uh, check their determinant, if you want, whatever. What I want is that the rank of this one is equal to the number of elements of the set and conditioning on, on C. This is equivalent to say that all minors of dimension cardinality of C plus one of this matrix are zero. Repeat again, this is equivalent to this condition that's already been shown to you. Okay. The algebra comes in through this blue bit. Okay, this again, I repeat, is something that I told you I thought it was important, but for the moment, okay, let's give it as known. And then let's start looking at our simple example. Here we have this. No, let's start with this one. We have a very extremely simple graph on two nodes. Nodes called two, nodes called three. I'm looking at this one. Two variables. What I know? I know that this, if there is no edge between them, this is the independence model. Independence model corresponds to zero in the covariance matrix. Here it is. But having zero here means that tau Two, three is equal to zero. And look how I translated this. I'm translating it into the ideal generated by two, two, three. So from this zero here, 
I'm saying that this zero corresponds to the set of all polynomials in how many variables? Well, at least three variables, <laughs> by which two, two, three are zero. Okay with that? So let's do the same for a slightly more complex matrix. This corresponds to this example here. So I know that in the concentration metric, I will need a zero. this is a typical mistake because it's natural to take uh, a principal minor. We 
have uh, that equality, that polynomial sub to zero. We build out of it the polynomial idea. That is, we say it generates a polynomial idea. And the very technical way, correct way to say this all, is that sigma belongs to the Zarinsky closure of the algebraic variety of the polynomial idea generated by sigma 3, 1, 1, minus, blah, blah. Looking at this polynomial, can you notice something? Some characteristic? It's a binomial. And degree of this term is 2, degree of this one is 2. Well, let me tell you, without proving, that for any graph, for any graphical model, you, by following this rule, you will obtain conditions which are binomials, same degree. And this links into Markov basis. Okay? That is, you obtain what they are called, the algebraic representatives of graphical models are toric ideas. Toric ideas are generated by binomials. We consider very special toric ideas generated by binomials of the same degree. We'll see that in some cases the degree can increase the variable as well. Okay, um, how are we with time, sorry? Should I stop? Because here this overview, if you want, is over and we can talk later about the mark of combination. So, do you want to ask questions? You say, um, Toric ideas. I write it because this is a word that appears often in algebraic statistics, but not only. There is a big, big literature in a computational commutative algebra, algebraic geometry, studying these type of structures. I wonder actually if in your work you found it, because they occur quite uh, often. Hmm? So we special, okay. Other questions? So maybe we can have a break, a bit, a longer break. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Eva. We have five minutes break. Thank you. 